ठीक है ना good afternoon and today online we are going to learn about lymphoproliferative disorders multiple myelomas and myeloproliferative neoplasms if you notice the title of the talk everything is in plural so we are not going to discuss about a single disease entity and the the things will become much more clear as we proceed through the talk. So first we'll discuss about multiple myelomas. My aim is not to give you a comprehensive overview. My aim is to clear your concepts which from my own experience I have found difficult to understand and um, the rest you can catch up on uh, on your self reading. So, the first case which was described in multiple myeloma was in 1844 a patient, Sarah Newberry, who was a 39 year old housewife who had uh, presented to Dr. Solly. The, the slide shows her, uh, her portrait on the left side, and you can notice some peculiar malformations in the skeleton uh, which are suggestive of plasma cytomas. You can notice on the right hand the bone deformity with the swelling as well as on the left uh, lower end of the femur where there is a swelling. The pelvis is also a site of a plasma cytoma and she was treated with orange peel extract uh, and uh, there was no definitive treatment at that point of time and when she passed away Dr. Solly and Burkett uh, did an autopsy and the autopsy 
was, as you can read here on the right side in the text, it was described cells as very clear, their edge being remarkably distinct and the clear oval outline enclosed one bright central nucleolus, rarely two, never more. This is very, very uh, a textbook description of plasma cells. Next, they go on to mention in their autopsy finding as the disease was probably an inflammatory process and that it began with a morbid action of blood vessels in which earthy matter of bone is absorbed and thrown out by kidneys in the urine. Again, a remarkably prescient observation with regards to um, uh, blood vessels in the marrow, uh, what the, the current pathology describes as uh, uh, angiogenic uh, uh, pathology in the myeloma uh, and the earthy matter of the bone is absorbed and thrown out by the kidneys in the urine which is again a prescient observation with regards to uh, renal involvement by the paraprotein which is produced by neoplastic plasma cells. We'll, we'll discuss this as well in further slides. The next turning point in the history of myeloma was this remarkable letter uh, addressed to Dr. Jones. For those of you who have not been able to guess, this is Dr. Benz Jones, the portrait on the left side of the slide. And it describes that this is a very, very, you know, uh, uh, well-known letter in, in for myeloma nerds. The, the tube contains urine of very high specific gravity. When boiled, it becomes slightly opaque. On addition of nitric acid, uh, nitric acid, it effervesces and assumes a reddish hue and becomes quite clear, but as it cools, assumes the consistence and appearance which you see. Heat reliquifies it. What is it? This is what we now know as Benz Jones proteins. And Benz Jones is a single person. They are not two different persons. The patient on whom this finding uh, has been described is um, his death certificate is shown on, on, on the lower right corner of the slide. And uh, the death certificate, if you can read, uh, is uh, it, uh, it mentions uh, um, as the, the cause of death as atrophy from albuminuria. Uh, so I think, again, a prescient observation with regards to Sarah Newberry as well as this uh, patient. The, the, the first patient who has been extensively described and in whom the paraproteins were first studied, like Benz Jones proteinuria was first described in this patient. The, another turning point in the history came with um, uh, the the, uh, a detailed study of paraprotein in multiple myeloma. And uh, uh, the, the you know that uh, plasma cells produce antibodies. Cancer is a neoplastic growth of a clone of cells. So, you know, a clone of plasma cells proliferates in a cancerous fashion and leads to uh, pathologic manifestations of multiple myeloma. So, uh, if, the, if, the, if the plasma cells arise from, uh, it is a single clone of cells, then you know, all these plasma cells produce a single form of protein. Now that protein can be intact protein. Intact means mm -hmm. uh, intact heavy chain and light chain, you know, intact globulins, the paraprotein, or it can be incomplete in the form of excessive production of only light chains. So the, 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 uh, each monoclonal antibody is composed of, you know, two heavy and uh, two light chains. The heavy chains, uh, you know, from your preclinical days is, IgG, A, M, D, and E. Uh, the light chains are either kappa or lambda. So uh, uh, the the plasma, the neoplastic clone of plasma cells produces uh, a, cl a single class of antibody in the form of you know IgG kappa, IgA lambda, IgG lambda, and so on and so forth. IgM, IgD, and IgE are form less than one percent. Whereas if the plasma cells produce, uh, uh, the clone produces excess pro excessive production of 
uh, light chain, then the light chains will be either all kappa or all lambda. So this kappa and lambda chains, when I have uh, I have na have been named in honor of the people, who, the scientists who first described it in the in this seminal paper in 1956, uh, Leonard Congold and Rose Lipari. So in, in honor of Congold, it is it was called it is called kappa, and uh, Rose Lipari was uh, Congold's assistant, and uh, that is uh, let uh, connotates lambda. So kappa and lambda light chains. On the right side is Gerald Edelman, who received a Nobel in 1962 for first complete description of the structure of antibody, and um, the tracing uh, below his picture on the lower right corner of the slide shows uh, mm, uh, a typical pattern which is seen on uh, mm, electrophoresis of the protein, gel agarose gel electrophoresis. So this is the densitometry traced from the electrophoresis. Uh, you know, it, it starts that the, 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 the green curve is the one which is seen in, is described in a normal patient and it is albumin, which is the predominantly protein in patient's uh, serum, then alpha 1, alpha 2 and beta uh, globulins and then uh, a flattened curve uh, uh, representing gamma globulins. Now when the neoplastic clone of plasma cell proliferates and one particular uh, gamma globulin is produced in excess by the neoplastic clone of plasma cells, then it leads to a church spire kind of peak which is described as M spike, M stands for monoclonal, so monoclonal spike. Um, so, so while one particular class of antibody is produced in excess, the other classes of antibodies, for example in a patient in whom plasma cells produce IgG kappa, then IgA IgM, IgD, IgE, as a result, uh, uh, they are produced less uh, because the other plasma cells are suppressed by the neoplastic clone. So that the multiple myeloma, although the neoplastic clone pro uh, produces one class of one particular class of antibody in excess, the other ones, as the production is suppressed. So multiple myeloma is associated with hypogamma globulinemia. Hypogamma globulinemia leading to immunoparesis, impaired humoral immunity. Apart from myeloma, there are other plasma cell disorders uh, which have which I've enumerated here for the sake of completeness, that is monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, uh, small train multiple myeloma, solitary plasma cytoma, AL amyloid light chain amyloidosis, and Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia. I will describe briefly the first two entities for the sake of completeness of discussion of multiple myeloma. So what is monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance? It is <coughs> less than 3 grams of monoclonal spike along with less than 10% of plasma cells. When both these criteria are met and the patient has no clinical manifestations whatsoever in form of you know anemia, bone lesions, hypercalcemia, renal failure, which is attribu attributable to plasma cell uh, clonal proliferation, proliferative disease, PCPD, plasma cell clonal proliferative disease. Then patient has monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. However, if either of these two criteria, you know, either there is a three gram or higher monoclonal spike para protein, or and more than 10% of plasma cells, either of these two criteria is met, then the patient has been described to have smoldering multiple myeloma. And when, but still, in a smoldering multiple myeloma, it, it does, uh, the, these are the patients who do not have any clinical manifestation. So the concept should be very clear between mono, what, what do we describe as monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance and what do we describe as smoldering multiple myeloma. And the third category is obviously the overt disease, multiple myeloma, which has more than equal to 10% plasma cells and a paraprotein, which is detectable in 98% of patients. 2% have non-secretory multiple myeloma. The plasma cell, they just proliferate. However, they don't secrete any form of detectable paraprotein. And patient has overt disease manifestations in form of anemia, bone lesions, hypercalcemia, and renal failure, which is again attributable to excessive paraprotein production. 
for the sake of understanding i'll just mention it once again that you know with regards to m spike and plasma cells in the marrow there is no difference with regards to small tick multiple myeloma and myeloma the difference is only with regards to manifestations of clinical disease whereas when we talk about small tick multiple myeloma and monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance both these entities patient has no symptoms or signs suggestive of overt disease apart from a para protein which is detectable in a patient so it for the 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 practical implication of this is that mgus and small tick multiple myeloma both these are incidentally detected a patient comes to you with some other disorder and you notice the lab biochemistry which has been sent to him uh, to the lab for as part of the clinical evaluation and you notice that you know albumin is slightly low total protein is high signifying uh, ag reversal albumin globulin ratio reversal and you say hmm let's do a electrophoresis in him and then you notice that okay you you, you have detected a m spike and then depending on some other clinical feature uh, some other uh, lab parameters you 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 take a call on whether to evaluate and do a marrow on that particular patient or not and if the marrow shows up you know more than 10% plasma cells then you say that okay there is a para protein which is more than or equal to 3 grams per liter there is more than equal to 10% plasma cells okay this is small tick myeloma or when only one of these is present then it is or uh, when sorry when neither of these is present then patient has mgus let's you know to just elaborate on this concept further for better and for for your better understanding let us run through a clinical case so this is a 61 year old lady who was completely asymptomatic and was found to have an igg kappa para protein in routine exam the m protein was 1.2 grams per deciliter free light chain renal function hemoglobin and calcium were completely normal so you know less than 3 grams per deciliter of protein patient is completely asymptomatic you you diagnose this patient as monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance you know usually you don't um, narrow at this level of para protein if the para protein is high then you would consider doing a marrow examination on that person so diagnosis of mgus was established and patient was put on follow up every 6 months could you perform additional tests yes or no so in this case no you don't marrow these patients you the patient is asymptomatic has no uh, red flags for presence of a disease you just keep this patient on a follow up so you know all para all multiple myelomas they evolve from mgus so monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance is a pre malignant condition and uh, the uh, risk of uh, the rate of evolution to an overt multiple myeloma from mgus is 1% per year whereas the uh, the uh, smoldering multiple myeloma is a different entity there the the rate of evaluation the, the rate of evolution to uh, overt multiple myeloma is higher as compared to mgus so the natural sequence of events is mgus then smoldering multiple myeloma and then multiple myeloma so it all depends on which stage of disease course the you, the patient comes to your attention mgus is you know like this uh, methodical low risk 1% progression per year whereas um so most of this data is has been collected from mayo clinic and uh, by bob kyle bob kyle is now 95 years old he celebrated his 95th birthday last month and he was the person he's the person who this uh, who coined the entity of monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance in 1960s and from 1960s onwards recently last year uh, 2000 two years back in 2018 they published a 34 year follow up of that particular cohort of patients 
in whom monoclonal gammopathy was first time described. So as I mentioned, MGUS is a um, pre-malignant condition and <coughs> if you notice uh, on, the on the left side uh, the survival curves, there are two survival curves on the left side. One is the top curve it, 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 it describes patients who have died with the disease means they have the cause of death is without the, the, the initial cohort of 1384 patients of monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance who have been followed for a median of 34 years in, in that cohort of M, all, all patients who have been diagnosed with MGUS this is the group of patients the curve on the top the, the the black line and the uh, uh, brick red color line these are the patients who have died with disease and in whom the disease had not progressed so when we when we say the patient has died with disease rather than the patient has died from disease so these are the patients who have died with disease and you know 80 percent of these patients you know more than 80 percent in fact nothing happened they just died with a diagnosis of MGUS Whereas the curve on the the on the on the lower side of the left left panel, the left graph, it shows patients who have progressed, and you can see the progression. It, it depends, uh, you know, on um, even the para protein. If the if the, if it is an IgM related para protein, monoclonal gamma MGUS, or if it is a non IgM, that means IgG or IgA MGUS. You know, th these are the patients who have uh, died because of progression of MGUS to multiple myeloma and this is hardly you know uh, 11 to uh, I mean less than 20 percent of the patients so so this is one aspect which you need to know then you know s somebody might ask a question that fine so you know if, if do doctor I have been diagnosed with MGUS what is my expected lifespan do I do I expect a shorter lifespan or not so you know this is in this seminal paper from NEJM, the Bob Kyle actually and his group from Mayo Clinic, they show that, you know, as on the right side, that patients have uh, 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 less uh, expected survival, less than expected survival. So, so again, take home message is, you know, patients with MGUS on a long term follow up, they have 6.5 times the risk of developing plasma cell dyspraxia non IgM MGUS you see 82 percent of the patients they have a chance of evolving to multiple myeloma amyloidosis the progression is 1 percent per year whereas the IgM MGUS patients they are the ones who develop amyloidosis non-Hodgkin's lymphoma CLS and the progression is 2 percent per year for first 10 years and then 1 percent per year thereafter I hope you understand this concept of MGUS and why it is important you know occasionally you might encounter patients in your clinic who have incidentally uh, been diagnosed with uh, MGUS and they come to you for advice so you know you can even you can offer them advice as per this long term follow up data so again coming back to our case so she remained stable for 3 years at that time she consulted with a myeloma expert and you know this expert had a different way of looking at the things and in spite of a stable M component the doctor decided to do a biopsy and that showed 28% plasma cells, 97% of these were clonal with uh, translocation 414 cytogenetic abnormality. What is your diagnosis now? Now, now this patient, she has a, a, a para protein which is stable, less than 3 grams per deciliter, but the bone marrow plasma cells is more than 10%. So now this patient falls into the category of smoldering multiple myeloma. So, you know, you remember the pic I showed you previously this one you know MGUS nice clean methodical whereas smoldering myeloma is like this it is associated with a clear risk and the risk is connotated by again we come back to this uh, paper by Bob Kyle in New England Journal of 2007 this is the same cohort which he followed up from which, he, which they have been following up from last uh, 35 odd years and um, so you can see the smoldering myeloma curve on the top so obviously the risk of progression to multiple myeloma is higher as compared to the patients who have uh, MGUS and if you look at this curve uh, uh, you know carefully 
you can see that there are three different paths you know the, so the first part is you know the, the 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 steep slope initially it is you know these are probably the case of multiple myeloma patient the uh, patients who have uh, you know yet to develop a clinical manifestation but the disease course is aggressive so you know these are th these group of patients of smoldering myeloma they have the risk of progression to multiple myeloma is 10% per year as compared to you know 1% per year of mgus so these are the 10% the curve slope is steep the next one is slightly indolent behavior so 10% per year for the first 5 years so then the group of patients in whom the progression is slightly less so 3% per year these are the ones who have a slightly indolent behavior and then beyond uh, the first 10 years the progression the curve flattens so now these are th there is no difference between this group of patients and the ones with MGUS 1% per year so you know smoldering myeloma the risk of progression is 10% per year for the first 5 years 3% per year for the next 5 years and then 1% per year thereafter the risk of progression for MGUS is 1% per year I hope you are following me. So let's take a different scenario. So there is a patient that has been diagnosed with MGUS or and you know you somebody marrows her and the and the diagnosis changes to smoldering myeloma. Suppose that patient of MGUS remains stable for three years. Uh, uh, sorry, smoldering myeloma remains stable for three years develop backache that worsened at night along with shortness of breath and exertion at that time she consulted with a myeloma expert with a hemoglobin of 8 grams per deciliter white blood cell count of uh, 5500 uh, platelet count of uh, 140,000 and, and the calcium is elevated and the creatinine is elevated as well you, the doctor decides to do a bone marrow biopsy that shows 50% plasma cells most of them clonal with a particular cytogenetic abnormality. What is your diagnosis now? Now this is clearly an overt multiple myeloma. The patient has developed a multiple myeloma. So the clinical presentation is weakness, fatigue, bone pains, fractures, infection, renal failure. Again, we come back to this paraprotein curve. You know, so just to elaborate what I have mentioned to you previously, plasma cells with a nucleus, perinuclear half, a vacuoles which contains all those antibodies that are being produced and then, then that, that are uh, secreted out by the plasma cell uh, in, uh, in the and below uh, structure of a antibody two heavy chains two light chains and uh, free light chains you know that the plasma cells 97% uh, of the myelomas have a intact glo globulin IgG kappa IgA lambda uh, and excessive production of free light chains as well both co-occur 97% of them have both 3% of them have neither they are non secretory myelomas uh, on, the, on, the, on the right side the, the two panels the, the middle one shows normal serum protein electrophoresis albumin is the tallest peak uh, of all the proteins which are present in the peripheral blood then alpha 1, alpha 2, beta and gamma globulin uh, the immune fixation is on the agarose gel electrophoresis you put uh, you detect you, you, you type them by um, immune fixation on you know which para protein is predominant so if there is no para protein then obviously IgG A M kappa lambda everything is of equivalent proportions whereas on the right side if the patient has a a para protein being produced by the neoplastic clone of plasma cells then there is a church spire peak and if you do an immune fixation in them then in this particular example which I'm showing to you there is an IgG lambda you can see the dark dark bands below and the rest as I mentioned previously are underproduced so they may or may not be detectable so this in, in this particular example which I'm illustrating to you the plasma cells uh, the neoplastic clone produces excess of IgG lambda para protein the other other 
plasma cells are the production is suppressed antibodies are suppressed almost none are detectable here so myeloma again is associated with impaired humoral immunity or immunoparesis uh, along with hypogamma globulinemia the utility of free light chain assay it you know the the quantity is the cutoffs i have shown here for the sake of completeness and uh, uses are you know again screening for multiple myeloma response assessment risk assessment and so on so again you know how what what are the manifestations you 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 do a bone marrow on them the upper right corner of the slide shows a typical bone marrow aspirate with excessive plasma cells then uh, it is the most common hematological malignancy five year survival with modern treatment is al almost half of the patients which you see in your clinic overall survive for uh, five years and beyond the diagnosis is based on monoclonal immunoglobulin excessive production of plasma cells bone marrow plasma cytosis and skeletal lesions previously you know s conventional skeletal surveys were being done with plain x-rays now uh, all over the world and in big centers of the world and even here at aims we have switched to a modality called as low dose whole body ct uh, the whole body is, uh, ct is done in a fraction of a time uh, compared to skeletal x-rays and picks up more uh, bone disease at diagnosis you know the screening tool should be should carry a, uh, uh, a high sensitivity so high sensitivity means less false negative rates so uh, the pickup rate of low dose whole body ct is higher for the x rays 30% of bone mass needs to has to be lost before you know a lytic lesion is visible on a conventional x ray whereas with low dose whole body ct the pickup rate is better so we do low dose whole body ct an example is shown here the arrows highlight the presence of lytic lesions so it does both cross it it, it does cross sectional imaging along with uh, mm, uh, 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 planar views and uh, on the right side it uh, the pie charts show the various para proteins which are produced you can see all more than half of the myelomas produce an igg para protein and then igm is second mo uh, ig igm is uh, and IgA are of relatively equal proportions. The th thing is that IgM does not pre present with multiple myeloma per se. It is produced uh, along with um, a Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia. I won't be discussing that disease, but just remember when you read it in your uh, textbooks that you know there is a disease called Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia, and that is associated with an IgM para protein. It is also a plasma cell proliferative disorder. IgA myeloma is uh, second most commonly encountered in clinic apart from uh, IgG and uh, it, it, it generally ca it, uh, generally the disease behavior is more aggressive as compared to IgG myeloma. Uh, then light chain only you know no para protein no intact immunoglobulin is produced only light chains are produced is seen in around five to six percent of the patients and as I mentioned uh, at the initially at the start of my talk that IgD and IgE myelomas are very rare. The pie chart on the lower right corner of the slide shows, you know, um, again, the diseases which are associated with paraproteins, MGUS, myeloma, amyloid, smoldering myeloma, uh, macroglobulinemia of Waldenstrom's, um, and other, some other lymphoproliferative disorders like marginal zone lymphomas, uh, which, uh, and CLL, which produce a para protein, but the para protein in those is less than 1.5 percent in, in in lymphomas in Waldenstrom's, you know, because IgM is produced. So if you remember from your pathology and uh, um, biochemistry days, the in the IgM is a pentamer, so it most of it is extravascular, so more hyperviscosity symptoms can happen with IgM. So clinical presentation, monoclonal protein, detectable in more than 80% of serum protein electrophoresis. If you do an immune fixation on it, the detection rate goes up to 93%. And if you add a free light chain, then the detection rate goes up to 98%. So generally for the purpose of screening, we uh, in, the, in the clinic, we request a serum protein electrophoresis with immune fixation and free light chain assay. 
the UPEP stands for urine protein necrophoresis and UIFE stands for urine immune fixation. Uh, both of them are, uh, you know, uh, it is technical, logistics wise it is a bit difficult because these are done on 24 hour urine collection samples and uh, more often than not patients are not very enthusiastic about collecting urine for each and every episode of urine for uh, a full 24 hours. So although it is recommended but uh, many times those options have to be foregone for uh, practicality and compliance and uh, again 98% so you know 2 to 3% of plasma cell clones they just don't produce any para protein they are non secretory and that mandates a bone marrow examination for diagnosis cytic bone lesions are seen in 67% in uh, increased plasma cells in the marrow are seen in almost 100% of the patients anemia which is often normochromic and normocytic is seen in 70% of the patients hypercalcemia and renal failure are seen here as well. So this is the diagnostic criteria for multiple myeloma. A uh, very simple mnemonic is CRAB SLIM where C stands for hypercalcemia, R stands for renal failure, A stands for anemia and B stands for bone lesions. So up till 2014 it was CRAB criteria. Then you know, uh, International Myeloma Working Group got together and uh, added three more criteria. The mnemonic for this that is SLIM, and uh, S stands for 60% of more than 60% uh, of clonal bone marrow plasma cells. LI stands for night chain ratio, and M stands for focal lesions and MRI. So the SLIM part was added because you know even though the patients may not have the CRAB criteria in the sense that overt disease is not present. However, if those patients who come to you with MGUS or um, less MGUS, or those patients who come to you with a smoldering multiple myeloma, a smoldering multiple myeloma where they don't have any symptoms of overt disease, but they, they have, you know, either of these three, six, more than 60% of plasma cells, no overt disease symptoms. Treat those patients as myeloma light chain ratio more than 100 but no symptoms of over disease in the form of hypercalcemia renal failure anemia or lytic bone disease but they have excessive light chains in the ratio treat it as multiple myeloma and do an MRI pick up one focal lesion uh, sorry more than one focal lesion but no symptoms of overt disease treat it as multiple myeloma so you know CRAB is overt disease and SLIM are the criteria which are sufficient on their own to pick diagnose the patient as myeloma even if CRAB is not there. Same thing which I was trying to explain to you. So why multiple myelomas not myeloma because you know there are a w if you look at it uh, with regards to genetic abnormalities, each genetic abnormality has its own peculiar uh, presentation. So essentially diseases are more and more getting well defined with regards to uh, gen uh, cytogenetic abnormalities and mutations and the disease behavior of one differs from other in some peculiar aspects. So you know there are primary abnormalities. So these are the primary abnormalities that are present in all the myelom all the malignant plasma cells from the beginning. So it, they will have you know uh, they and they are all you know mutually exclusive. So they will have trisomies or they can have these translocations which are shown here. And then so these are the ones which are present right from MCUS stage. If you are able to look at it, if the patient presents to you at the right instant of the time and if you are able to look at it. These are the abnormalities that are present right from the MGUS stage. And then as they evolve into uh, overt myeloma, they accumulate these secondary abnormalities. So the primary abnormalities are present right from the beginning. And as the disease evolves from MGUS to smoldering to overt myeloma, secondary abnormalities are accumulated. 
the primary abnormalities are mutually exclusive so you know a, a patient will have only trisomies which have a uh, which have a you know a slightly better prognosis or the patients will have uh, translocations you know 414 1416 814 1114 and, and then the patients having these primary abnormalities as a, as as they evolve into myeloma they acquire a second hit the nutsons two hit hypothesis if you remember the term from your robins and these will be you know 17p deletions or they acquire monosomies or amplifications so these are secondary abnormalities staging system revised international staging system is the one that is most often followed and uh, I'm sure it will be described in your textbooks as well. So it is RIS, Revised International Staging System, ISS 1, 2, and 3. You, you, as part of this, you need a LD lactate dehydrogenase and you need a, a bone marrow examination with the fluorescent in situ hybridization performed on that to, to pick up those cytogenetic abnormalities. Treatment wise, these are a different class of drugs and I have pictori uh, uh, pictorially represented them, uh, uh, them here for the sake of you recollecting them better. Uh, protease inhibitors, botizomib which is shown here, carfilzomib, kiprolis is shown here on the right side of botizomib, then ixazomib is an oral drug. Uh, Imids are thalidomide, lenalidom immunomodulatory drugs. Uh, I've shown here th thalidomide. Uh, you know, it is not it, uh, it is notorious because when it was initially tried as a hypnotic agent and prescribed to many pregnant ladies in late 50s, early 60s, they ended up with uh, focomelia kids. And uh, recently, the story has been very recently last week well chronicled again in New York Times. You can go back and read that. Uh, linalidomide is uh, a newer analog of thalidomide. Then there are some conventional chemotherapeutic agents, cyclophosphamide, melphalan, which are very often used even today. And then corticosteroids, dexamethasone or prednisolone. And then there are some targeted therapies, monoclonal antibodies like daratumumab. And uh, you can see the daratumumab here adjacent to a vial of melphalan, darzalex. It, we are very often using it and uh, the cost is around 6 lakh rupees per month. It, it, is, it is expensive but it is currently one of the most uh, potent drugs in our antimyeloma drugs in our armamentarium. This is the evolution of treatment for multiple myeloma. In 1960s only melphalan and prednisolone were there. In 1980s people started experimenting with autologous transplant. I'll just add two three slides here so that you understand what a bone marrow transplant is then in 90s uh, uh, late 90s early 2000s botizumab was launched linalidomide thalidomide and then 2010 uh, after 2010 we got hold of carfilzomib in in the last five years we have almost five new drugs Toxicities, you know, thalidomide, neuropathy, constipation, sedation. Thalidomide was first tried as a hypnotic agent in pregnant ladies and rash. Linalidomide does not have neuropathy. So that is something which is important when you are giving a combination therapy. You know, a combination of obviously bortezomib and thalidomide carries a higher risk for neuropathy. Linalidomide doesn't. So linalidomide is something that is used now in the front line very often. Thalidomide, uh, the West has practically uh, stopped using thalidomide outside Europe. In the US, nobody uses thalidomide. But in, in, in Europe, a lot of uh, people use thalidomide still because linalidomide is not approved by the European Medical Agency. Botizumab has GI symptoms, neuropathy, and cytopenias. And whenever you are using thalidomide or linalidomide, remember to cover for, along with dexamethasone, remember to cover for a DVT prophylaxis with aspirin. Botizumab does not lead to DVT, but botizumab uh, carries a higher risk of herpes zoster reactivation, so patient needs to be put on acyclovir prophylaxis. Uh, briefly about stem cells. So what are stem cells that have the capacity for self-renew and differentiate into mature or specialized cells? 
so hematopoietic stem cells so what we do, what what exactly do we do in a bone marrow transplant is that you know even either in the form of a high dose chemotherapy or a radiation you ablate the patient's bone marrow and infuse them uh, uh, from an, uh, uh, either an autologous or an allogenic stem cells the difference you can see here so what in, in multiple myeloma what we do is something which is in the light panel not in the slightly dark panel autologous transplants we don't do allogenic transplants in multiple myeloma for autologous transplants you pump you give the patient gcsf which is a growth factor which leads to mobilization of uh, stem cells from the bone marrow and they start circulating in the peripheral blood please remember gcsf does not lead to multiplication of stem cells it leads to mobilization the stem cells they don't circulate in the blood in higher numbers so you 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 give the patient gcsf that bumps out the stem cells from the bone marrow and they start circulating in the peripheral blood and then using afrss you skim off the stem cells from the peripheral blood and return the remaining blood back to the patient so it is a circuit that goes through a machine and uh, extracorporeal and uh, the 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 stem cells which have been circulating in the peripheral blood uh, which are mobilized from the bone marrow and which are circulating in the peripheral blood by virtue of action of gcsf granulocyte colony stimulating factor uh, these stem cells are collected and then they are given back to the patient as as pa as part of the treatment for uh, for a myeloma or a lymphoma so these are the two diseases that are treated with the autologous stem cell transplant so you know what happens is that in multiple myeloma uh, you, you 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 treat a patient and you treat a patient and uh, suppose the patient has a 100% disease at the time of the diagnosis you 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 treat the patient and the disease goes down but uh, say from 100% it goes down to 30 or 20% and when you treat them with a high dose therapy melphalan in multiple myeloma case the disease goes from 30 to 20% to say minus 200% and from there the risk of relapse is less as compared to the disease relapsing from say 30% with medical treatment alone so technically the right term is high dose therapy or high dose melphalan followed by autologous stem cell rescue so you know just some data to suggest that uh, high dose treatment has got a better survival rate as compared to a conventional therapy intensive therapy is high dose melphalan followed by stem cell rescue and the conventional therapy is conventional chemotherapy and you can see there is a difference in the survival curves the purple curve is high dose therapy and the blue curve is uh, conventional chemotherapy so patients who undergo a high dose therapy or a bone marrow transplant in multiple myeloma they survive more so how do we tailor the therapy in multiple myeloma obviously genetic risk category i have mentioned before primary secondary cytogenetic abnormalities then by age and comorbidities obviously you wouldn't treat a 70 or a 80 year old gentleman the same way you will treat a 30 or a 40 year old person with regards to dose modifications and the intensity of therapy then obviously patients who have a severe renal impairment you 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 have to avoid certain drugs which are potentially nephrotoxic like thalidom uh, like lenalidomide Len lenalidomide dose needs to be adjusted in renal failure so instead you choose drugs which are more friendly on the kidneys which don't need any dose modification so you know genetic risk category age comorbidities in the form of you know diabetes or hypertension or coronary artery disease or a severe renal impairment at the time of presentation these are the three uh, ways in which you need to titrate your therapy or individualize the therapy for a particular patient so uh, high risk these are the following translocations that have a high risk standard risk on the right side you can see these are the ones who have a standard risk therapy again for these particular uh, cytogenetic abnormalities in patients who are transplant ineligible so transplant ineligible means these are the elderly patients or patients who have significant comorbidities who cannot tolerate a bone marrow transplant who have a higher risk of death in a bone marrow transplant these are the patients whom you will consider a transplant ineligible you wouldn't offer a transplant in these patients so in those patients you treat with a combination of these three drugs for 12 months and then follow it up with maintenance 
so rvd is you know v stands for velcade which is uh, the innovator molecule for bortezomib and then r stands for revlimid which is lenalidomide and d stands for dexamethasone which is steroids so this is the combination which you will offer in your patients of all multiple myeloma up front all over the world this is the standard treatment for multiple myeloma and uh, these you give this a combination of these three drugs for 12 months and then following that depending on you know which cytogenetic abnormality the patient has you put these patients on lenalidomide maintenance or a bortezomib maintenance then there are those patients who are transplant ineligible so you know i i i gave you that example of disease reducing to uh, from 100% it's just an example for better understanding from 100% you have reduced the disease to say 30% and then you consolidate that with a bone marrow transplant high dose melphalan followed by autologous stem cell rescue and as a so the in the in those patients after four cycles of either of these treatments you collect the stem cells and then you do a transplant and then put those patients on maintenance so that disease does not relapse remember one thing i have forgotten to tell this to you beforehand that myeloma even in the modern era is incurable so control is still what is practiced on hardly 10% of the multiple myelomas get cured in the sense that the disease doesn't relapse after initial therapy in 90% of the patients multiple myeloma has a relapsing course so early relapse late relapse but eventually the patients 90% of the patients do relapse with treatment hence the best option is to treat them up front with the best possible treatment and that is a combination of lenalidomide bortezomib and dexamethasone if the patient is fit enough to undergo a autologous transplant do a transplant on those patients and then put them on some form of maintenance in the form of lenalidomide or a bortezomib in those patients who are because of their uh, comorbidities or because of the frailty or because of the age uh, per se or because they have you know a heart failure or because of any other reason for which they cannot tolerate a high dose melphalan uh, treatment or a bone marrow transplant which is similar you then put these patients on treatment for 12 months followed by some form of maintenance the idea is to control the disease as better as possible so that the risk of relapse gets minimized so that that is multiple myeloma now coming to cll chronic lymphocytic leukemia i'll 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 just go through this case with you for the sake of better understanding so the 50 year old otherwise healthy person found to have lymphocytosis during a routine history uh, and physical with a primary care physician and is referred for additional workup the additional history is he is asymptomatic and has denies any recent infections you do a physical examination no lymphadenopathy no spleen or liver enlargement no rash no other skin lesions a blood count reveals to be uh, his white blood cell count is 23000 per microliter with a absolute lymphocyte count of 19000 hemoglobin and platelets are normal so here here is a patient who has been incidentally found to have elevated blood peripheral blood lymphocytes so do you how do you proceed with some additional workup for this patient so obviously you have done a physical examination you have elicited a detailed history and you have ordered a baseline complete blood count which has shown elevated blood lymphocytes so the peripheral smear is shown here on the right side you can see uh, numerous lymphocytes uh, uh, in the peripheral blood film you the so the, it shows small mature lymphocytes with a narrow border of cytoplasm and a dense nucleus lacking any discernible nucleoli a flow cytometry which is form of a peripheral blood immunophenotyping all those cd markers which you have memorized so painfully and rigorously during your pathology days time to recall those so you know flow cytometry just enumerates those cluster differentiation or cd markers on the on the peripheral blood and it shows that you know more than 5000 clonal b lymphocytes in the peripheral blood which has been you know sustained for at least 3 months 
so this is a fulfilling diagnostic criteria for CLL and obviously I'll remember from multiple myeloma clone so clone means a light chain restriction all producing either kappa or lambda that can be picked up on flow cytometry so light chain restriction so when you, when these criteria are fulfilled you would think of CLL so immunophenotype cells co-express 5, 19, 20 and 23 generally B lineage markers with a surface IgM or IgD not both either one of them CD20 79 is typically dim 20 is dim and again clonal so restricted kappa or lambda light chains additional definitions small lymphocytic lymphoma same as CLL but predominantly lymph nodes as and less of lymphocytes in the peripheral blood you know lymphocytes they circulate they go to the lymph node they come to the peripheral blood so if you happen to catch a patient at a stage where it's, it's all in the lymph node and very little in the peripheral blood you would need to put a needle there do a biopsy and diagnose the same by the same features or a biopsy instead of peripheral blood that's all uh, or and again like MGUS there is an enti entity called all myelomas evolve from monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance all CLLs evolve from monoclonal B-cell lymphocytosis the criteria of which you can see here on the slide in CLL there is more than 5,000 5, or equal clonal B lymphocytes in MBL the lymphocytes are less, less than 5,000 absence of lymphadenopathy or organomegaly to rule out SLL small lymphocytic lymphoma diagnosis and obviously no disease re related cytopenia or symptoms that is MBL Staging, Rai, Kanti Rai, uh, he's into private practice now, but at one point of time he was an academic physician, hematologist in the US. He described Rai system, Kanti Rai is from Jodhpur, and you can see the Rai system here. The other one is a Binet system. Both need, you, you need to know both when you are discussing a CLL case. It's important to document that in the history as well. Prognostic markers. Again, you know, there are these couple of prognostic markers, a, a, a small interactive multiple choice questions for you, which testing needs to be performed, immunoglobulin heavy chain variable mutation status, or a fluorescent in situ hybridization for these cytogenetic abnormalities, or a sequencing for P53, or a sequencing for that. The correct answer is that two, you need to perform a mutation st status, you need to perform the FASH, and you need to perform for a P53 mutation. Uh, it is important because you know um, uh, it all depends IGHV is a mutation status that that defines basically the B cell clone which is proliferating in a CLL uh, which stage of maturity it has acquired a cancerous growth so if it uh, IGHV is unmutated then the cell is more premature if the IGHV is mutated the cell is has acquired some form of maturity so prematurity is bad and the, the more premature the cell is, it is bad for the cancer. The more differentiated the cell is, the more you know, well behaved it will be in the future and more responsive to conventional chemotherapy it will be in the future. So IGHV and, and, and this is what is basically shown in the curves on the right side, unmutated versus mutated. Molecular genetics, you know, need to be done because you can see deletion 13q are well behaved as compared to deletion 17p deletion 11q is you know bad behavior not as bad as 17p but still a bad behavior and uh, uh, trisomy 12 is somewhere in between normal is somewhere in between important to note deletion 13q has you know uh, better more well behaved as compared to even normal Some additional markers which are of academic interest now, not generally done. Then, like, you, you need to calculate a score which is CLL IPI, and these are these five independent prognostic indicators, and the treatment is guided by CLL IPI. So, you know, that in the, in the, in the, in the, in the patient in which we were discussing, Testing and diagnosis demonstrated mutated IGHV genes with a deletion of 13Q. The patient was observed in your clinic for seven, seven years. And you know, 13Q is a well-behaved, 
mutated IGHV is well behaved, more differentiated. Remember that over the recent months, this has started describing progressive fatigue after seven years of observation and follow up. So remember, you don't need to treat CLL. All cases of CLL. If you if a, if you diagnose a patient in a CLL, you need to treat only when the disease is troubling the patient. If CLL doesn't trouble the patient, you don't trouble the CLL. Remember that fact. So additional history, you know, because of this fatigue, he is missing his days at work. However, he denies any B symptoms in the form of fever, night sweats, weight loss, denies any recent infections, white blood cell count is 98,000, predominantly all lymphocytes in the peripheral blood, hemoglobin is, you know, 11.5 with a platelets of 89,000. So platelets are slightly low, hemoglobin is holding up. On examination, small, some small palpable axillary lymph nodes, no liver or spleen enlargement. Any other additional workup you need for this patient now? So this is what the National Cancer Care Network shows. You know, when do you treat a CLL? You generally you observe, but when you treat is something here. Look at this box. Just ignore the rest of the slight clutter. So patient is treated when patient has severe fatigue, night sweats, weight loss, fever without infection, threatened end organ, you know, some large lymph node mass that is compressing the kidney or is involving the bowels or uh, some, some uh, big lymph node mass in the, in the mediastinum that is leading to some pericardial effusion or pleural effusion, something like that. So threatened end organ function or a progressive bulky disease. Progressive bulky disease means, you know, spleen more than 6 centimeters below the costal margin or a lymph node mass more than 10 centimeters. So even if there is a large lymph node mass in the abdomen, but the patient is okay, you, you, you do an ultrasound or a CT scan and you say that, okay, the lymph node mass is more than 10 centimeters. Yes, that is an indication for treatment or a progressive anemia or a progressive thrombocytopenia. If any of these are present, then you treat a CLL. Otherwise, you don't treat a CLL. If the CLL is not troubling the patient, you don't trouble the CLL. Remember this fact. All CLLs don't need treatment. Assessments before the treatment, history and a physical examination, a CBC, differential chemistry, you, you will offer a serum immunoglobulin to be done. You know, CLLs are occasionally associated with a paraprotein, better to pick that up. CLL is associated with hypogamma globulinemia and impaired humoral immunity, similar to multiple myeloma. CLL also is associated with hypogamma globulinemia or impaired humoral immunity. So it's better to pick up low immunoglobulins and then you will have to keep that in mind, okay, this patient has a low IgG level, this patient is at risk of developing infections. Again, a marrow aspirate, a biopsy is needed only if you have some suspicion, otherwise generally uh, in CLL patients, they don't need a marrow exam. A CT scan of the chest, abdomen or pelvis, not necessarily indicated, but it is always helpful to acquire that, to look for any, you know, impending organ dysfunction or pick up a large lymph node mass of more than 10 centimeters. PET CT only in special cases, generally it is not done in CLL. Not done in CLL, remember that. So for predictive purposes, what molecular tests should be performed in our patient? For predictive purposes, it is always help, again the multiple choice questions. Uh, predictive purposes, you, you, you pick up a P53 mutation, those are the ones that have a uniformly dismal prognosis to, in spite of best possible treatment and you would like to sequence for, you know, um, uh, deletion 17p, 11q and all those things. So IGHV mutation status, we have discussed this, molecular cytogenetics and the P53 mutation testing are needed for uh, testing these patients before treatment. Treatments, you know, there are some fantastic targeted drugs. There's a rituximab, which is a monoclonal antibody, which will be discussed further. Then there is a venetoclax, that is a BCL2 inhibitor. Then there is a idalalacib, that is a, uh, a protein, uh, uh, a phosphatidyl in ositol 3 kinase, PI3K kinase inhibitors. Idalalacib is not used as often. Rituximab is used in the front line. Uh, a brutin tyrosine kinase inhibitor, ibrutinib, it is used in the front line. These are the two that are more often used. Idalalacib is not used in the front line. 
and uh, the Benito Clats is now approved for uh, in uh, for, uh, for as a first line therapy in CLL relapse. So treatment early stage asymptomatic observe those patients advanced stage or symptomatic then you need to evaluate those patients you need to risk stratify which will tell you a prognostic risk whether this CLL is going to respond to treatment well or whether this CLL is not going to respond to treatment well so if the so how do you define it as a lower risk it is a mutated IGHV more differentiated remember we discussed that deletion 13p remember deletion 13p has a uh, has a has a outcome which is even better than normal cytogenetics trisomy 12 again if the patient is younger and fit you can consider chemotherapy if the patient is elderly or if the patient is frail uh, you would avoid chemotherapy in those patients if the patient has a higher risk which is unmutated IGHV remember more immature deletion 17p or p53 mutation or deletion 11q you would you would you would you would prefer uh, these are the patients who don't do well with conventional chemotherapy in those patients you will consider a btk inhibitor ibrutinib remember ibrutinib lower right corner imbrovica uh, until recently it was available at the cost of 3.5 lakh rupees every month but now a generic in india has been launched with the cost of around 25 to 30,000 rupees per month. So most of our patients will be able to afford that now. And this is something that is an accepted standard of care, frontline therapy, fantastic drug, no chemotherapy injections, 70% uh, of the patients tolerate it very well with a long-term survival. And again, venetoclats as a second line and some other fantastic cell uh, therapy called CAR T cells, which we can't discuss here, but that is something very interesting. Now coming to myeloproliferative neoplasms. So myeloprolif so so you know so again myeloid neoplasms and the lymphoid neoplasms. Myeloid neoplasms they give um, Okay, so, so lymphoid neoplasms, ALLs, acute lymphoblastic leukemias, lymphomas, CLLs, myelomas. So we discussed C uh, CLL and variants and myeloma and variants previously. So they are all lymphoid neoplasms. Myeloid neoplasms means, you know, uh, 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 neoplasms from myeloid lineage of cells, which are myeloid lineage of cells, erythrocytes, monocytes, polymorphs, neutrophils, platelets. So these are myeloid lineage cells. So we are going to discuss now about myeloid neoplasms. So again, they, they are further they can be further classified for the sake of understanding between an acute myeloid leukemia and a chronic myeloid leukemia. Acute myeloid leukemia, Dr. Samir Bakshi would have taken a, a, a class last week. So we are not going to discuss that any further. Among chronic myeloid leukemias, there would be myeloproliferative neoplasms and myelodysplastic syndromes. So we are going to discuss about myeloproliferative neoplasms. So remember, the, the difference of acute and chronic is based on untreated natural course and history of the disease. Acute means without any treatment, patient will die within few weeks. Chronic means without any treatment, patient will have survival ranging from months to years. So that is why they are called as chronic, without any treatment, months to years without any treatment weeks days to weeks is acute so AML is an aggressive disease uh, CML is not an aggressive disease with regards to the natural and course and history but yes eventually it needs treatment as well so these are the following myeloproliferative neoplasms CML Dr. Bakshi would have discussed wouldn't be discussing it further then polycythemia vera essential thrombocytosis or thrombocythemia primary myelofibrosis, a mastocytosis, eosinophilias, neutrophilic leukemias, and then a waste basket diagnosis of unclassifiable. So they all come at, uh, under myeloproliferative neoplasms. So if you notice this slide before, if you, if you notice that asterisk mark on the, on, uh, on the top of the slide, so you know, again, some mutation is acquired, and depending on that mutation, a particular lineage acquires a proliferative growth 
potential right so this is with regards to an acute leukemia you, i'm sure you would have read about translocation 15 17 a21 inversion 16 so th when these are acquired patient gets an acute myeloid leukemia if some other mutation is acquired then patient gets some other myeloid proliferative neoplasms and the list is here so bcr abl cml some eosinophilia abnormalities again pdgfr a b polycythemia vera jak2 v617f mutation or uh, exon 12 mutation so essentially 99% of polycythemia veras have a jak2 mutation either a v617f or an exon 12 myelofibrosis 50% of them will have a jak uh, a jak2 mutation and uh, another 35% of them will have a cal reticulin mutation and uh, mpl and other mutations are seen in 5% of the cases so 15% of myelofibrosis will have no mutation and around 85% of them will have some mutation essential thrombocytosis 50% of them will have jak2 mutation 35% will have a cal reticulin mutation 1% of them will have some other mutation and essentially 15% of them will have no mutation neutrophilic leukemia around 90% of them will have cs uh, colony stimulating factor 3 receptor mutation and mastocytosis 90% 95% will of them will have a kit mutation worth while because these are some things that we order very frequently in our day to day clinical practice makes some sense to remember these mutations so to, when when a patient comes to you with a suspected myeloproliferative neoplasm the first question you should ask yourself is is it reactive or secondary process or a marker of an underlying hematological malignancy you know a patient comes to you uh, uh, from a recent uh, uh, one to one and a half month trek to himalayas or a resident of leh and ladakh and a hemoglobin of 17 or 18 is there you would you, you know that this is a high altitude polycythemia these patients don't need any uh, any detailed evaluation when when a patient comes to you from plains you would order a uh, evaluation so that is an example of a reactive or a secondary process versus an underlying hematological malignancy if there if you suspect an underlying hematological malignancy what is the specific diagnosis just briefly i'll illustrate here polycythemia vera blood jak2 mutation polycythemia vera jak2 mutation from peripheral blood not detected but a erythropoietin is suppressed then you request for a exon 12 mutation if it is normal or elevated you know that this is not polycythemia vera similarly on the right side essential thrombocytosis patient comes to you with a say a platelet count of 12 to 16 lakhs in the peripheral blood you order a jak2 mutation if it is comes out to be positive you know that this is a uh, essential thrombocytosis you would request a further evaluation along those lines if it comes out to be negative you 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 know that 50% of them will be negative with jak2 mutation then you will evaluate them accordingly same goes for myelofibrosis as well so all these mutations they can be done on the peripheral blood almost all of them and they will help you in deciding on which patients you need to do a bone marrow examination which patients you don't need to do a bone marrow examination or a further evaluation so remember this algorithm so if 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 the peripheral blood shows predominantly leukocytosis more likely to be cml less likely to be you know essential thrombocytosis or polycythemia vera or a myelofibrosis if the patient has ex uh, thrombocytosis then you you would you would suspect essential thrombocytosis uh, polycythemia vera can present with uh, elevated platelet count as well um, If, the, if there is a large spleen then a lot of peripheral blood pooling is there occasionally you will get a, high, a, a, a hemoglobin which is not that high um, but a platelet count or high you know you will get it but typically for for the for the, for undergrad level high platelet count in peripheral blood thrombocytosis first possibility is essential thrombocytosis leukocytosis it is cml erythrocytosis obviously it is polycythemia vera if you see a bone marrow like this here you can see some you know fibrosis which is led to streaming in the marrow you will think of poly primary myelofibrosis occasionally cml and polycythemia vera may have 
some fibrosis in the marrow but not this extensive on the right side you, you know even to an untrained eye it is evident that there is marrow this is a bone marrow biopsy which is hypercellular so if the bone marrow biopsy is hypercellular increased cellularity in the marrow think of polycythemia vera or a, a, a pre-fibrotic stage of a minor fibrosis occasionally essential thrombocytosis so you know a, a peripheral blood film examination and a bone marrow examination can give you very good morphological clues as to what the underlying disease is splenomegaly is seen in poly primary myelofibrosis are the patients who present with a massive spleen occasionally a cml which comes to you in a later stage of the disease in india you will get a massive splenomegaly a polycythemia vera can you will, you will get a massive splenomegaly uh, clinical manifestations portal vein thrombosis butchiari syndrome hepatic vein thrombosis that is massive splenomegaly post bath pruritus hot water aquagenic pruritus will be seen uh, erythromelalgia is a typical manifestation where you know these uh, uh, inflammatory mediators are released in, uh, mm, uh, in, 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 in ends of digits and leads to uh, uh, uncomfortable sensation. On the right side of the slide you can see a typical course and uh, disease course evolution of polycythemia vera. Patients can be asymptomatic, they can have splenomegaly, isolated erythrocytosis, isolated thrombocytosis, then they get uh, they go into an erythrocytotic phase where uh, proliferation of uh, erythroid lineage, platelet lineage, leukocytosis, massive spleen, uh, blood becomes more viscous, they may get thrombosis. Occasionally, you know, this uh, large uh, proliferation of platelet, it adsorbs the von Willebrand factor uh, on, on the surface and they can present with hemorrhage as well, what we know call as acquired von Willebrand disease. Everything is described in Harrison's. Just read Harrison's in detail. You will find all these uh, interesting things which I'm talking about. Then, what Robin says: uh, polycythemia vera can burn out into myelofibrosis or can blast into uh, acute myeloid leukemia. So, a burnt-out polycythemia vera will be post-polycythemia vera myelofibrosis, where the blood count goes down, thrombocytopenia occurs, spleen goes on enlarging and the patient starts developing fever, weight loss, other systemic manifestations. So a polycythemia vera can burn out into myelofibrosis or it can blast into an acute myeloid leukemia. Both those things can occur. So acute myeloid leukemia can develop directly from polycythemia vera which is relatively rare. A more common clinical course is via myelofibrosis. So this is what is illustrated here. Okay current treatment algorithm is you know just look at the patient if the patient has is a low risk disease without extreme thrombocytosis no history of uh, stroke no history of coronary artery disease just put them on aspirin and they should be fine if the patient is you know more than 60 65 years of age if the patient has extreme thrombocytosis you know you just put them on aspirin or um, just give them some hydroxyurea to decrease the platelet count. If the patient has a polycythemia vera with a high hemoglobin, add phlebotomy to that to target a hematocrit of less than 45%. Coming to myelofibrosis, the disease course is there is an early myelofibrosis and there is an overt myelofibrosis. Myelofibrosis is important to remember that patients have more constitutive symptoms, more large spleen and more cytopenias as compared to polycythemia vera which has high hemoglobin and platelet or essential thrombocytosis which has high platelet. Causes of death are here shown here secondary neoplasia, portal hypertension, bleedings, infections and so on. There are some risk scores which you don't need to remember but just know that there are some risk scores that are used to predict survival in, in, uh, in myelofibrosis. Describing a, a case in detail, 33 year old asymptomatic male presenting with a hemoglobin of 13.8 and a white blood cell count of 7200 with a platelet of 11,60,000 was diagnosed with essential thrombocytosis started on hydroxyurea 4 years later hemoglobin is slightly low 
a bone marrow was done showed evolution to myelofibrosis remember polycythemia vera essential thrombocytosis over a period of time in this case 4 years can evolve to myelofibrosis right a jack2 mutation was done it was negative again uh, 48 years that is 33 years so 15 years after the diagnosis fatigue dyspnea on exertion night sweats metabolic symptoms spleen 15 cm below the costal margin hemoglobin is lower 9.6 white blood cell count has gone low platelets are holding up myelofibrosis disease has now gathered some momentum and there is a targeted drug for that called ruxolitinib which is a jack2 uh, genus kinase inhibitor available in the market we are using it routinely here in our clinic as well patient was started on ruxolitinib that led to resolution of splenomegaly and systemic symptoms hemoglobin is now 10 grams per deciliter so this is ruxolitinib ruxolitinib uh, you know unlike imatinib it only leads to symptom control imatinib leads to an alteration in the natural course and history of disease imatinib is used in cml in case you don't remember that so imatinib inhibits bcr abl kinase leads to a better survival and a change in natural course and history of disease whereas ruxolitinib is a jack2 inhibitor it does not improve the survival it just changes uh, the patient's symptom burden so it is a symptomatic control it is not a uh, you know if you if a polycythemia uh, if sorry if a myelofibrosis patient is put on ruxolitinib those patients don't live longer they just have a symptom control remember that so and and you know it has a some side effects which leads to discontinuation in 50% of the patients as well so again this patient was started on ruxolitinib and the patient had resolution of splenomegaly resolution of symptoms after some time patient developed shortness of breath on exertion and fatigue hemoglobin was low started on erythropoietin hemoglobin improved and uh, after however after some time uh, again symptoms increased and spleen spleen with splenomegaly which had regressed previously has now recurred again so patient has effectively started uh, progressed on ruxolitinib so again i want to stress here ruxolitinib jack2 inhibitor used routinely in myelofibrosis with regards to symptom control however it does not control the natural course and history of disease like so here this is this this is a classic example patient was started on ruxolitinib symptoms got controlled however after some time disease progressed so uh, just to uh, previously i had explained to you an autologous transplant in in myelofibrosis the curative treatment is an allogeneic transplant allogeneic transplant where the stem cells are collected from a healthy donor in a similar fashion you give gcsf stem cells get mobilized from peripheral blood uh, from the bone marrow into the peripheral blood they are collected how uh, and they are given to the patient the difference here is that because the stem cells here are given from a different person and they are not person's own stem cells so here patient has to be given some form of immunosuppression to prevent graft versus host disease this is illustrated here in this slide after allogeneic transplant you know you can see here 70% survival in the top curve so patient underwent a transplant and now patient is uh, following up well and patient has technically been cured of disease that's all thank you and now i will hand over to my colleague dr jagruti for some discussion of pharmacological aspects of this disease thank you very much if there are any questions we can take them up later
Example LM fuse Zumab. It is used in chronic lymphocytic leukemia. LM fuse Zumab binds to the CD52 antigen, which is found on the lymphocytes. And uh, once it is bound to these lymphocytes, it will attract the immune cells to specifically destroy these leukemia cells. Targeting immune system checkpoints. And third way is the attaching to and blocking antigens on cancer cells or other nearby cells that help in growth or spread. Example is Trastuzumab or also called Herceptin. It is an antibody against the HER2 protein. The breast and stomach cancer cells sometimes have huge amounts of this protein on the surface. When HER2 is activated, it helps these cells to grow. Trastuzumab binds to these proteins and stops them from becoming active. Now we have conjugated monoclonal antibodies. These are combined with a chemotherapy drug or a radioactive particle. It delivers a toxic substance where it is needed most. It lessens the damage to the normal cells in other parts of the body. Radio labeled antibodies, example ibritumomab, which is made of monoclonal antibody drug rituximab and a radioactive substance yttrium 19. So antibody acts against the CD20 antigen. A B lymphocytes and it delivers a radioactivity, uh, radioactive material directly to the cancer cells. Then we have the chemo label antibodies like Brentuximab Vedotin, which is an antibody targeting the CD30 antigen, which is also found in lymphocytes, which is attached to a chemotherapy drug and therefore they were delivering the drug straight away to the lymphocytes. So, uh, bispecific monoclonal antibody is made up of uh, parts of two different monoclonal antibodies, meaning that they can attach to two different proteins at the same time. Uh, B linatumumab is used to treat some types of leukemia. One part of B linatumumab attaches to the CD19 protein, which is found in some leukemia cells and lymphoma cells, and another part attaches to the CD3, a protein found in the immune cells or uh, T cells. A binding to both of these proteins, this drug brings the cancer cells and immune cells together, which is thought to cause the immune system to attack the cancer cells. Adverse effects of monoclonal antibodies. Monoclonal antibodies are given intravenously, and the antibodies themselves are proteins, so giving them can sometimes cause allergic reaction. This is more common when the drug is first being given. So the range of adverse effects may range from fever, chills, weakness, headache, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, low blood pressure, and rashes. So we have uh, these different types of monoclonal antibodies which, are, uh, which act as epidermal growth factor receptor inhibitors, human epidermal growth factor receptor 2 inhibitors, platelet derived growth factor receptor inhibitors, vascular endothelial growth factor inhibitors, immune checkpoint inhibitors, antibodies targeting cell surface antigens. So various monoclonal antibodies which act as epidermal growth factor receptor inhibitors are cetuximab, penitumumab, nesitumumab. Monoclonal antibodies which are acting as human epidermal growth factor receptor 2 inhibitors are trastuzumab, Pertuzumab, monoclonal antibodies which are acting as platelet derived growth factor receptor inhibitors are Olaratumab, monoclonal antibodies which are inhibitors of tumor angiogenesis or vascular endothelial growth factor inhibitors are <coughs> Bevacizumab, Remucidumab, drugs which target the immune system which are the immune checkpoint inhibitors like Iplimumab which is anti-CTLA4, fully human IgG1, Premilimumab, Nivoli, Nivolumab, Pembro, Pembrolizumab and Etizolimumab. They are also immune checkpoint inhibitors. What are the antibodies targeting the cell surface antigen? It has already been mentioned uh, in the previous class that rituximab is a very important drug which is used in the, the hematological malignancies. Rituximab is a chimeric murine human IgG1 anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody. 
Its therapeutic use is in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, rheumatological and other autoimmune diseases including multiple sclerosis. And what are the side effects uh, associated with rituximab? Infusion related side effects like toxicity, fever, rash, dyspnea, B cell depletion, late onset neutropenia, risk of hypersensitivity reaction. So these are uh, seen. Rare side effects will include severe mucocutaneous skin reaction, in which in including Stevens Johnson syndrome, risk of tumor lysis syndrome in patients with high tumor burden in the circulation and reactivation of hepatitis B virus or, <coughs> or polyoma virus, JC polyoma virus. Another uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies targeting CD20 is ofatumumab. It is also used in CLL after treatment failure. Immunosuppression and proportionistic infections are seen when we use this. Hypersensitivity reactions during infusion and myelosuppression are also observed. So we have to monitor the blood counts during the treatment. Another monoclonal antibody is OB-NU2-Zumab, which is also humanized IgG1 anti-CD20. It is used for CLL in combination with chemotherapy and frequent side effects include cytopenia, fever, cough, musculoskeletal disorders. lm 2 map is targeting the CD52 antigen. It is used in CLL and multiple sclerosis. Dinutube C map is again anti-GD2 and uh, Daratube mu map which is targeting CD38 is used in multiple myeloma in combination with lenalidomide or bortezomib. lo 2 map which is targeting CD319 is also used in multiple myeloma. So after uh, discussing uh, uh, about the monoclonal antibodies, various monoclonal antibodies, let us discuss what are the drugs uh, which we com which we group under pathway targeted therapies. So what does this mean? Targeted therapy stops the action of molecules that are key to the growth of cancer cells. Thus it affects cancer cells more so than normal cells. Targeted therapy specific action differs from a traditional chemotherapy which affects all fast growing cells. So uh, most important is uh, the tyrosine kinase receptors here. Now what are the tyrosine uh, protein uh, kinases? So protein kinases are enzymes which regulate the biological activity of proteins by phosphorylation of specific amino acids with ATP as the source of phosphate thereby inducing a conformational change from an inactive to an active form of the protein. There are different types of protein kinases. We have protein serines or threonines, protein tyrosines and we also have dual specificity protein kinases which that phosphorylate protein serine, threonine and protein tyrosine. The tyrosine kinase receptors, like uh, the example shown here is that of transforming growth factor beta. So when it attaches to the ligand, uh, here uh, PGF beta, it dimerizes. Dimerizes means two tyrosine kinase receptors, they come together. And once they dimerize, downstream events are activated. So we have the, uh, different types of um, mediators which are involved in these downstream events and different drugs therefore can modulate these various pathways. So growth factors and receptors in cancer cells. So we, uh, uh, one um, uh, like inhibitors of epidermal growth factors receptor. So um, epidermal growth factor receptor is essential for the growth and differentiation of the epithelial cell. As you see, this is also a tyrosine kinase receptor. So once uh, the uh, uh, it binds to its uh, epidermal growth factor receptor binds to the epidermal growth factor, then it gets activated, it dimerizes, and uh, its kinase activity uh, 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 like starts various downstream events. It may be acting through the ras ras pathway, P P uh, AKT pathway, mTOR pathway. The different pathways are activated.
so again this is uh, it's the same diagram again uh, displaying that uh, what are the various drugs which can modulate the protein tyrosine kinase inhibitors of uh, epidermal growth factor receptors we can have monoclonal antibodies like cetuximab penetumumab which are acting and preventing the uh, the uh, activation of these uh, uh, tyrosine kinase receptors or we have we can have drugs like gefitinib allotinib efatinib which are acting uh, and in the, in the uh, preventing the downstream activation of various pathways for instance uh, let us uh, allotinib is a drug which is a reversible inhibitor of egfr tyrosine kinase and it competitively inhibits atp binding at the active site of kinase gefitinib inhibits the egfr tyrosine kinase activity by again by competitively blocking the atp binding domain of the kinase efatinib is also another drug which is um, which is uh, which is inhibiting these uh, tyrosine kinase activity similarly osimertinib and uh, and we have also monoclonal antibodies which i mentioned like cetuximab which is a recombinant chimeric human mouse igg1 antibody which binds to the extracellular domain 3 of egfr and prevents ligand dependent signaling and receptor dimerization thereby blocking cell growth and survival signals now we, we are not discussing these in details but um, another an antibody is penetumumab acting similarly like cetuximab so here we have uh, we are showing the entire gamut of receptors here we have the epidermal human epidermal growth factor factor receptor which we already heard to and as you can see in the diagram we have the monoclonal antibodies which can inhibit this trastuzumab trastuzumab which is a monoclonal antibody which binds to the extracellular domain of her2 inhibiting the hetero and homo dimerization and signal transduction pertuzumab which is again Pre uh, prevents uh, the ligand dependent heterodimerization of uh, these receptors and we have uh, drugs like uh, lapatinib which is an uh, uh, which is an inhibitor of the egf1 and her2 tyrosine kinase so another uh, group of receptors in this uh, category in the tyrosine kinase category are the platelet derived growth factor receptors pdgfr here these are mentioned here as platelet derived growth factor receptors so again uh, we have uh, various monoclonal antibodies which can bind to the receptor and block the ligand mediated receptor activation example is olanzapine and after uh, this we have um, other drugs which are acting on the intracellular protein kinases like the inhibitors of the raf kinase this is a ras raf pathway and we have drugs which will inhibit we have discussed the uh, briefly the drugs which are acting on the receptors and now the the uh, the downstream events so inhibitors of the ras kinase example bemurafenib debrafenib and um, so uh, and inhibitors of the mek like trametinib cobimetinib so uh, acting on the mek so acting on the ras and acting on the mek we are not discussing the these drugs in detail <coughs> just uh, giving the site of action of these drugs so trametinib is inhibitor of raf kinase and cobimetinib again uh, inhibitor of the mek protein kinase activity 
so these are the downstream inhibitors then we have inhibitors of jac1 and jac2 so the uh, tyrosine kinase receptors which are acting via the jac stat pathway so we have drugs which will inhibit uh, the uh, jac stat pathway like ruxolitinib which is an analog of atp that inhibits the protein kinase activities of jac1 and jac2 then we have another drug which are cyclin dependent kinases cdk46 inhibitors and this mod these drugs modulate uh, the intracellular signaling during cell cycle progression so this is a site of action for the cyclin uh, dependent kinase inhibitors so bruton tyrosine kinase so this btk protein tyrosine kinase uh, plays an important role in the function of b cells and the uh, the ph domain of the btk binds to the phosphoinositol phosphate 3 so the btk tip3 phosphorylates plc uh, uh, phosph uh, phosphorylates the phospholipase c which hydrolyzes phosphatidyl inositol thereby activating the ip3 c uh, calcium phosphokinase pathway in b cells so a btk inhibitor is going to be inhibiting this so this is an important drug ibrutinib which was also mentioned in the previous uh, discussion so it is a small molecule inhibitor that inactivates the btk through covalent binding to cis481 near the atp binding domain so ibrutinib inhibits a malignant b cell proliferation and is indicated for the treatment of patients with with mcl who have received at least one prior therapy in cll patients in sll and wm patients neutropenia fever thrombocytopenia hemorrhage anemia diarrhea nausea musculoskeletal skeletal pain rash and fatigue are the common side effects onset of hypertension has been observed within less than a month and up to 2 years after the start of ibrutinib treatment atrial fibrillations are also observed in up to 7% of patients even malignancy uh, uh, may occur in up to 16% of patients most of them are non melanoma skin cancers then we have inhibitors of the bcr abl kinase so here is a bcr abl kinase so a single molecular event the philadelphia chromosome translocation t922 <coughs> <coughs> leads to expression of abl and bcr This fusion generates a constitutively active protein kinase BCR ABL, resulting in continuous and uncontrollable cell division. BCR ABL drives a malignant phenotype of CML. So inhibitors of the BCR ABL kinase include imatinib, dacitinib, and nilotinib. So imatinib, nilotinib, they bind to a segment of the kinase domain that fixes the enzyme in a closed or non-functional state, in which the protein is unable to bind its substrate. phosphate donor atp these three bcr abl kinase inhibitors differ in their inhibitory potencies binding specificities and susceptibility to resistance mutations in the target enzyme so imatinib shows therapeutic benefits in patients with chronic phase cml and uh, gist and a subset of patients with mucosal or acral lentiginous melanoma and chronic myelomonocytic leukemia adverse effects include gi symptoms like diarrhea nausea vomiting and all these three drugs they promote fluid retention edema and periorbital swelling myelosuppression occurs infrequently but may require transfusion support and dose reduction or discontinuation of the drug these drugs can be associated with hepatotoxicity then we have bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitor btk inhibitor which includes ponentinib ponentinib is a third generation bcr abl kinase inhibitor imatinib is the first generation 
So imatinib, which is the first generation, it lacks efficacy for the more advanced disease phases and serves as mutations in the BCR radial tyrosine kinase domain, which are resistant. So ponatinib is approved for the resistant CML and Philadelphia positive ALL. Adverse effects include arterial thrombosis and hepatotoxicity and dose limiting toxicities include elevated lipase or amylase levels and pancreatitis. Then the BCL2 inhibitors. BCL example Benetoclax. So BCL2 is a mitochondrial outer uh, present in the mitochondrial outer membrane. It controls programmed cell death, apoptosis and um, the uh, balance between the apoptotic and anti anti apoptotic uh, proteins actually determine um, the survival of the cancer cells. So BCL2 promotes cellular survival by inhibiting pro apoptotic proteins like BIM, BAX and BAT. In the presence of Benetoclax, BSP only proteins can translocate to mitochondria and initiate BAX, BAC dependent apoptosis. So if we inhibit the BCL2 which is anti apoptotic, the apoptotic proteins, uh, pro apoptotic proteins will act dominantly and cause apoptosis. So Benetoclax is uh, given orally and uh, its use is in uh, chronic myelocytic leukemia. Adverse effects include neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, diarrhea, nausea, upper respiratory tract infection. Absorption is increased 3 to 5 fold with meal. It is a substrate for CYP3A. Then we come to thalidomide and lenalidomide. So these are again the very important drugs as mentioned in the previous class. Thalidomide originally, originally was used for the treatment of pregnancy associated morning sickness but was withdrawn uh, because of uh, teratogenicity. Focomelia, focomelia was observed in the, uh, in the babies that were born to mothers who had taken thalidomide. And it re-entered clinical practice in the treatment of erythema nodosum leprosum. And uh, its further research has revealed that it has anti-angiogenic and immunomodulatory effect. Lenalidomide is, an, is a derivative of thalidomide and it, was, it, is, uh, it has immunomodulatory activity. Both thalidomide and lenalidomide possess potent activity in patients who newly diagnosed and heavily pre-treated or relapsed refractory multiple myeloma. So, uh, thalidomide, they have a direct effect on the tumor cells causing uh, growth arrest or apoptosis. They also inhibit the uh, addition of cells to the bone marrow stromal cells due to the reduction of IL-6 release and they also cause decreased angiogenesis due to inhibition of cytokine and growth factor production release and also enhance T cell production of cytokines such as interleukin 2 and interferon gamma which increase the number and cytotoxic functionality of NK cells. So thalidomide um, is uh, absorption of the GI tract is slow and uh, highly variable it binds to plasma proteins and uh, thalidomide and its metabolites are excreted in the urine. Non-absorbed parts are excreted unchanged in the feces. So in comparison to thalidomide, dose adjustment is uh, much more required in case of renal failure for lenalidomide. Thalidomide is used in newly diagnosed multiple myeloma, relapsed or refractory or pre-treated multiple myeloma. Lenalidomide is used in again multiple myeloma, myelodysplastic syndrome and chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Side effects include sensory neuropathy and uh, teratogenicity is of course uh, there so it has should be a definitely it's contraindicated in pregnancy it can cause sedation and fatigue and constipation sedation is enhanced by alcohol barbiturates lenalidomide also causes uh, bone marrow function suppression and leukopenia and rarely hepatic and renal toxicity 
Tumor lysis in some patients with CLL may lead to lymph node swelling and tumor flare. Therefore, start at a lower dose in patients with CLL. It also downregulates CD20, a target for monoclonal antibody therapy. In contrast to thalidomide, this is the advantage. It causes little neuropathy, sedation or constipation, and there is lack of teratogenicity. Dose reduction is recommended in patients with reduced renal function with lenalidomide. So, the antibody is targeting cell surface antigens. So, we have already discussed rituximab, that it is anti-CD20, that it is used in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, in CLL, and rheumatological and other autoimmune disease. We have already discussed this. Other uh, antibodies, monoclonal antibodies like ofatumumab and obinutuzumab. And LMATUZUMAB, which is a CD52, anti CD52 is used in CLL and multiple sclerosis. So, uh, thank you. And um, uh, if there are any questions, you can come and discuss later. Thank you.
प्रेजेंटेशन भी दे देना भैया about uh, malignant bone tumors so what we'll be covering is um, we'll be covering mainly the uh, important ones because as i told you last week or in my benign bone tumor presentation malignant bone tumors is a vast uh, uh, area where you include all kinds of tumors from bony tumors cartilage tumors fibrous tumors uh, tumors of unknown origin and uh, histiocytic tumors and others but we'll be only focusing on those which will be very important for you in the exam and uh, which is uh, more likely that you will encounter sometimes in your practice so why is it malignant bone tumor is important because it can come as a short notes for you in your exam it will be uh, tested in your mcqs for your practical case presentation in your final year mbbs there is a possibility that you will be discussed about malignant bone tumors because this can come as a short case Obviously, you will be in, uh, involved in the patient care of these uh, some of these patients uh, during your further clinical practice, and that's why it's important to know about this. So the way I have structured this presentation today, I will take you through different cases, and um, at the end of a case, we will have a learning point or how that case was managed, and then we try to understand the malignant bone tumors from that. That's how I have structured it. But if you have any uh, uh, more suggestions you are welcome to let me know so first case this is an 18 year old male who sustained injuries to his, to his right thigh following a fall from bike there was a past history of pain in the right knee which the treating surgeon did not take into account and he was taken to a no local hospital where he was uh, x-rayed and underwent surgery see this was the x-ray which was done as you can see somebody has put a nailing for a possible spiral fracture of the uh, middle third of the femur but as you can notice that in the distal part there is something which is not very usual here these are old x-ray means these x-rays were taken a little bit later than x uh, than the surgery you can see the screw has actually backed out very poorly done procedure but what we need to know more is the surgeon has completely missed the lesion which was in the distal part of the uh, leg and which turned out to be a malignant bone tumor before going into the bits of it the first learning point for you here is any patient with trauma before you fix any fracture you need to x-ray one joint above and one joint below if you do not do that clearly you might end up causing a great amount of morbidity to this patient so the what will happen if you kind of do a nailing for osteosarcoma this is an osteosarcoma if you don't know so uh, as you can see there are multiple uh, bone, uh, m multiple sundry appearance of uh, osteoids uh, deposited <laughs> in the extracortical area of the bone. So the lesion is typically arising from the metaphysis, and um, there is also a little bit suggestion of a Cartman triangle here. Also, it's not very clear in this X-ray. So, what next? Any patient who have a suspected osteosarcoma. We need to do a staging workup. What we have a staging workup typically involves a X-ray of the chest, a CT scan of the chest, and also a bone scan. Why a bone scan? Because osteosarcoma, be being a tumor of a soft tissue, it will metastasize to the lungs and then to the bone. So there, there have been cases described of bone-to-bone -bone metastasis. So that's why osteosarcoma staging World Cup involves a bone scan apart from a chest CT. Okay. So having understood that this patient does not have any other lesions anywhere else in the body, the next step would be to go for a biopsy. So the once you do the biopsy, you have the diagnosis of osteosarcoma. How will we manage this patient? 
so you can go for upfront surgery followed by chemotherapy you can go for neo adjuvant chemotherapy so what is neo adjuvant chemotherapy it is a uh, adjuvant therapy where the chemotherapy will be given before surgery for few cycles then the patient will undergo surgery then after surgery the patient will receive further cycles of chemotherapy so this kind of a uh, sandwiching of surgery between two cycles of chemotherapy is called neo adjuvant chemotherapy and that is the standard of care most of the in most of these patients these days or upfront surgery followed by post op uh, chemotherapy and radiotherapy so the answer to this is chemo neo adjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgery so one thing you must understand what are the advantages of neo adjuvant chemotherapy number 1 it will help in reducing the vascularity and making the tumor more solid so that they are easy to dissect number 2 they take care of micro metastases say for example there are some small lesions in the lung which were not detected by the x ray or ct chest these micro metastases will be taken care by neo adjuvant chemotherapy and third we would also be able to prognosticate the patient for example if you give few cycles of chemotherapy before surgery and then you operate in the specimen you look for percentage necrosis percentage necrosis means how many percentage of cells are surviving and how many percent of the, of cells are dead if the percentage necrosis is more than 90% then it means that the patient is going to have good prognosis for osteosarcoma so if somebody asks you what are the advantages of neo adjuvant chemotherapy in mcq or in any standard setting you must say three things number one easier surgery due to uh, better uh, definition of planes and then making the tumor more solid and less vascular second it also helps in taking care of micro metastases third it also helps in uh, understanding the prognosis of the tumor okay so that's why the standard of care for osteosarcoma today is neo adjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgery so the uh, a protocol we follow here is uh, you might be a very uh, you might be knowing these drugs doxorubicin and cisplatin these are the uh, drugs which we give preoperatively three cycles since this patient had a lesion which was in the distal femur but somebody had spread the tumor to the entire compartment so because they have done a nailing so the tumor was removed along with the entire femur and he underwent a total femur uh, prosthesis so the neo adjuvant chemotherapy showed a necrosis rate of uh, more than 90% so he came to be one of the good uh, <coughs> good responders and he also received doxorubicin cisplatin 3 cycles post operatively so how would you classify osteosarcoma what is osteosarcoma osteosarcoma is a malignant bone forming tumor okay so osteoid per se means there is both organic component as well as inorganic component when organic and inorganic components are laid out it is called an osteosarcoma okay so majority of these bones are woven bone means these bones do not look as mature as a lamellar bone which is found in adult so in a adult patient if you have a bone forming neoplasm most commonly it is an osteosarcoma so the age group for osteosarcoma is 10 to 20 years of age commonly usually in the teenage but we also have a second peak when the patient is more than 60 years of age why is the second peak because there is a different entity called a secondary osteosarcoma for example osteosarcoma associated with pages disease so these entities are common only in the older age so that's why osteosarcoma is known to have a bimodal distribution with respect with respect to age group okay so how would the patient present the patient usually has a pain followed by swelling okay and what are the different types of osteosarcoma normally we classify them as intramedullary juxtacortical or secondary so in intra all intramedullary lesions are high grade unless proved otherwise so you have a primary high grade intramedullary osteosarcoma which is a conventional osteosarcoma as we uh, put it 
then you have a telangiectatic variety where you have multiple unirisible bone cyst like areas or you have a small cell variety which usually have a worse prognosis on the uh, other side we have something called a low grade intramedullary osteosarcoma which is very rare juxtacortical osteosarcomas these tumors do not involve the medullary cavity much rather they sit on the surface of the bone okay so they can be either paraosteal which has the best prognosis or they have there can be periosteal which are intermediary grade tumors very rarely you can also have high grade surface osteosarcoma secondary osteosarcoma as i said osteosarcoma associated with pages disease post irradiation osteosarcoma are occurring in other skeletal neoplasm for example fibrous dysplasia converting to osteosarcoma okay so this is a typical radiograph or the specimen picture of a parasteal osteosarcoma you can see there is a bone forming lesion which sits on the surface of the bone but as you can see there in, in the radiograph you can see a clear plane between the tumor and the host bone or the uh, parent bone so this sign is called a string sign okay and this is the typical sundry appearance of a normal high grade conventional osteosarcoma so high grade conventional osteosarcoma can be again divided into osteoblastic chondroblastic or fibroblastic depending upon the uh, amount of bone or amount of cartilage or fibrous tissue within the tumor and this is the typical cartman lang uh, triangle this again is a telangiectatic osteosarcoma as you can see the patient is skeletal immature and you can see the cartman angle is actually a layer of perios subperiosteal new bone perio formation uh, deposited beneath the uh, periosteum which is elevated by the tumor okay so if you have something like this this is called a cartman angle or a cartman triangle okay so by now we understand what is osteosarcoma it's a bone forming malignant neoplasm what is the age group what is the x ray appearance sunburst appearance cartman angle and what is that uh, the how we how do we go to manage these patients we do to do staging ultra followed by biopsy and what is the treatment involved which is neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgery okay so we move to the next malignant neoplasm which is ewing sarcoma so uh, uh, sorry chondrosarcoma here you can have a 40 year old male as you can see here the age group is more higher Presenting with swelling in the gluteal region for nine months. Okay, so you can see here. This is how the patient will present. Here, the patient will have less severe pain, but more complaints of swelling. Number one is swelling. Number two, as you can see, it's a long duration. The patient has been having swelling for nine months. So chondrosarcomas are relatively slow-going tumors, present with history of swelling, and they can be present in both. flat bones as well as long bones osteosarcomas majorly common around the knee distal femur proximal tibia followed by proximal femoris whereas why is this more why is osteosarcoma common in these areas because these are the areas where there is accelerated skeletal growth when the child is in the growth spurt so these are the areas where there is potential for the growing cells to become malignant whereas chondrosarcomas these happen in old age and they can happen both in the long bones as well as in the flat bones okay so this is the lesion treat the treatment for a chondrosarcoma is surgery and chondrosarcomas are usually not resistant to any uh, is not amenable to uh, chemotherapy or radiotherapy so any chondrosarcoma the treatment is surgery so how would you look at the chondrosarcoma in the x-ray so the cartilage tumor which will have calcification within the matrix as you can see we have multiple small small dots these are called punctate calcifications these punctate calcifications coalesce to become rings or knots when you have a lesion which is predominantly having punctate calcification with matrix mineralization that is a possible chondroid lesion and when the lesion becomes a um, malignancy the tumor will cross the boundaries of the bone and it will result in extraosseous soft tissue mass okay 
and these are the different ways by which a chondrosarcoma can present this is a proximal femur uh, that was a finger chondrosarcoma uh, which was found in the uh, phalangeal phalanx and here you have a distal femur chondrosarcoma arising out of an enchondroma so if you leave an enchondroma for lifetime some of these enchondromas can convert into chondrosarcoma okay so chondrosarcoma is typically of uh, older age group surgery is the treatment of choice okay so now we move to the third common uh, most common tumor which is the ewing sarcoma so ewing sarcoma the typical age group is 5 to 15 years so 9 year old child presenting with pain and swelling in the left thigh for 5 months and it's a diffuse swelling okay so we did all the skeletal workup like what we did for an osteosarcoma so what we need to know about ewing sarcoma is this tumor is belonging to a class of tumors called round blue cell tumors. They have a homogeneous matrix of round blue cells and majority of the differential diagnosis for Ewing sarcoma will be small cell variant of osteosarcoma or a lymphoma. So uh, the uh, Ewing sarcomas are known to have uh, translocation typically translocation 1122 which involves the EWG gene and uh, EWSR translocation and uh, uh, the diagnosis is fairly straightforward when the biopsy is done but if you have any kind of doubt with the diagnosis then nowadays we also have flow cytometry to assess the tra uh, translocation within the tumor cells and this is the typical location as you can see here diaphyseal lesion which is uh, meta metadiaphyseal lesion in a skeletally immature patient predominantly in femur but Ewing sarcoma can uh, affect a wide variety of bones including tibia or uh, flat bones such as pelvis or even vertebra okay so these are further MRI imaging of these tumors as you can see here the tumor has a long segment involvement of the femur and the patient underwent the chest x-ray CT scan skeletal workup staging workup and then a biopsy and near the patient underwent neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgery and as like an osteosarcoma so the only difference here is there we used cisplatin and uh, doxorubicin here we used um, 12 weeks of cycles before surgery every three weeks we on one cycle we will use venkristin adriamycin and cyclophosphamide in the second cycle, the patient will get iphosphamide and etaphosphamide. So, you have alternate cycles of VAC and IE for 12 weeks followed by surgery. And the post-op regimen will continue up to 42 weeks. Since this is a skeletally immature patient, we need to say save the joint because the joint is away from the uh, tumor. And we have done the extracorporeal radi radi uh, radiotherapy followed by fixation. The typical radiological appearance of a Ewing sarcoma is an onion skin appearance. As you can see, multiple layers of periosteal reaction uh, in a metadiaphyseal location is it is called an onion skin appearance. Okay. Okay. So next we go to the final case, which is a 75 year old male with a pain in the right thigh for four months. Patient is having multiple comorbidities, and as you can see here. It's a predominantly lytic lesion in the proximal femur which is causing a destruction of cortex and extraceous soft tissues but there is some suggestion of a lytic lesion at other places as well like in here or here. So all bony lesions in elderly uh, should be considered to be sinister unless proved otherwise and the most common diagnosis are metastasis, myeloma, when it is solitary it is called a plasma cytoma. When it is multiple, it is called a multiple myeloma, where soft tissue tumors are bone sarcomas, or sometimes they can be even lymphoma. So the difference is, sometimes myeloma will not be uh, uh, showing up on bone scan because these are cold on bone scans. They, they do not form bone. As you all know, bone scan is a technetium 99 metastable uh, labeled bisphosphonate. Only when bisphosphonate will be taken up in the bone, it will show up as soft spot in bone scan but because 
uh, myeloma cells do not take up bisphosphonate majority of the bone scans can be negative in multiple myeloma so you might have to go for a pet scan which will also help in the differential diagnosis of metastasis this patient also had a skeletal survey as you can see here there was a lesion in the L1 vertebra with a pathological fracture here and the uh, histopathology shows sheets of plasma cells which are CD38 positive and uh, when you have a histopathology like this then it is very classical of a plasma cytoma or a multiple myeloma okay so this is about the treatment um, um, for main uh, malignant bone tumors and um, the treatment for multiple myeloma is predominantly chemotherapy and when the patient needs a surgery it will be mainly for pathological fractures because multiple myeloma is chemosensitive we do not actually need surgery for eradication of disease the only indication for uh, curative surgery in multiple myeloma is when you have a solitary plasma cytoma without any uh, 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 systemic disease and uh, multiple myeloma you will also have uh, positivity of uh, serum altopyrosis or urine altopyrosis where you will have a typical M band due to the monoclonal um, <coughs> gamma globulins which is present in the uh, blood and they also have elevated ESR, deranged renal functions and high calcium levels and these need to be taken care when the patient is administered chemotherapy. Okay. So how to clinically differentiate between a benign and malignant bone tumor? Look for 5 points in history, 2 points in general examination, 5 points in inspection, 5 points in palpation. So the in history, what are the features in favor of a malignant tumor? You will have a pain followed by cell wing. The duration will be short. The patient will have loss of function. You will have symptoms suggestive of metastasis. And there will be history of chemotherapy. And in general examination, you might have multiple swellings at other parts or you will have symptoms suggestive of metastasis. On local examination, uh, you will uh, have a stretched and shiny, uh, shiny skin, dilated vein, irregular surface, wasting of limbs, ulceration or fungation. Palpatory findings, the temperature will be raised in a malignant swelling, whereas the temperature will be normal in a benign. There will be significant tenderness. The margins will be ill-defined. The swelling will have variable consistency and there is adherence of skin to the underlying swelling. That is, the skin is not visible. We look for two other points. The joint mobility will be restricted in the malignant swelling and sometimes you will have distal nodal aesthetic. So you have, when you cross this, uh, the, the examiner will ask you whether you opt for limb salvage surgery or amputation. So the idea of limb salvage surgery is Every patient with tumor of the extremity should be considered for limb salvage surgery. The tumor can be removed with an adequate margin and the resulting limb is worth saving. There is no justification of limb salvage surgery based only on prognosis. Okay, so what we look for is acceptable degree of function, a good cosmetic appearance, minimal amount of pain and durable enough to withstand the normal activities. So the only contraindication for limb salvage surgery, which again is an in indication for amputation is neurovascular encasement, displaced pathological fracture, fungating tumors or infected wounds or recurrence of a malignant tumor. Metastasis is not a contraindication. Thank you very much. कोई नहीं सर